Sounds good. Good evening. I'm calling this meeting to order. The time is 5.30 p.m. In accordance with the Texas Open Meetings Act, Texas Government Code Chapter 551, this meeting is officially open with a quorum present. This evening, students from Edward J. Briscoe Elementary will lead us in the Pledge of Allegiance. In just a moment, Pr Principal Octavia Gray will introduce them, but first, let's stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. My name is Octavia Gray, and I'm the principal at Edward J. Briscoe Elementary, and those are my amazing fifth grade ambassadors, and also here I have my um, parent communications liaison, Miss Pam, and Miss Lewis, our secretary. Um, boys and girls, when I say your name, I just want you to give a little wave. Um, we have Augustine Singamana, Melissa Rivera, Safi Issa, Zane Harris, Aline Garung, Tamaya Hill, Alina Tamang, Amanda McNary, Jackson Odukapira, and Amna Mansour. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Clint Bond from Communications Team will lead us in recognitions. President Ramos, members of the board, Dr. Scribner, our greeters this evening are from the Army JROTC unit at Eastern Hills High School where Katrina Smith is the principal. And students, if you would stand as I call your name, Private First Class Liberty and Young, Private Alia Franklin, Private Zeth Azura, and our senior Army instructor with us this evening is Chief Warrant Officer First Class David Lance, if we could thank them. This evening, we are also delighted to recognize a parent volunteer from Cesar Chavez Elementary School. Veronica Davila, would you please stand? Cesar Chavez Elementary School uh, Elementary is a school with strong parent engagement, but one staple volunteer that stands out is Veronica Davila, who has been volunteering for nearly a decade and has donated hundreds of hours of her time to give back to her daughter's school. To say she does it all is just an understatement. If you can name it, Ms. Davila is involved in helping with it. She sits on school committees, supports campus events, helps in the front office and the workroom, and has chaperoned countless number of field trips. Needless to say, Cesar Chavez staff can always count on Mrs. Davila to help in many different ways. She's been a steadfast volunteer the entire time her daughter has attended Cesar Chavez. Not only has she advocated for her daughter, but for the other students at that school as well. Principal Ordaz states, Mrs. Davila is a strong voice for students and family, always holding a high standard for the quality of service that students deserve. She works with our school to make positive things happen. Thank you, Veronica Davila, for being an exemplary volunteer helping teachers, students, your fellow parents, and overall giving back to your community. Family Communications Specialist Jessica Becerra will now present you with a Certificate of Appreciation. Thank you. And Mr. Ramos, I would like to um, relinquish some time to uh, uh, Dr. Scribner. He has a, a recognition. Okay. Thank you very much, um, Clint. And um, it's a recognition, but it's a celebration, really. Uh, our board president, Jacinto Ramos, Jr., was sworn in this past weekend as president of the Mexican-American School Boards Association. And several of us were privileged uh, to be there to help him celebrate this new role during Mazba's 50th year uh, anniversary. Uh, Mazba is focused on closing the gaps in Texas public schools, particularly for the Latinx 
uh, students who compromise the who, excuse me who comprise the majority of students statewide for English language learners who now make up 20 percent of our public schools. Mazba is committed to providing high quality continuing education. Uh, not only for our students, but for our staff, our faculty, uh, our administrators, superintendents, and board members, uh, with a special emphasis on equity. And I know that uh, President Ramos will be bring a, a focus on racial equity uh, in the year to come. For that reason, the statewide organization, uh, which has been serving local Texas boards since 1970, uh, could not be in better in more capable hands than uh, those of President Jacinto Ramos, Jr. This has been quite a year for our board president. He's also the current chair of the Council of Urban Boards of Education at the national level, the CUBE, uh, and is the board of director and is on the board of directors of Ta uh, Texas Association of School Boards, TASB. Congratulations, Cinto. We are all very proud and grateful to experience your leadership. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scribner. Um, looks like this concludes our schedule recognitions. We will take a short recess so our guests may depart if they so choose. inquiries made during a board meeting on any topic not posted on the agenda. However, the board may reply with one, a statement of specific factual information given in response to the inquiry, two, recitation of existing policy in response to the inquiry, or three, direct a person to visit with staff about the issue. While the board listens to concerns of a general nature, speakers should refrain from mentioning names of individual employees or public officers during their comments. Any employee, parent, or other member of the public is asked to comply with the appropriate grievance policy to have a complaint heard pursuant to the applicable board policy. No presentation may ex exceed three minutes unless the speaker has prior approval for additional time because of the use of a translator. Speakers who require the assistance of a translator are permitted double the allotted time of speakers who do not require the assistance of a translator. Furthermore, a speaker may not relinquish his or her time to another speaker. I ask that you please observe these rules for the purposes of effectively accomplishing the business of the meeting in a timely manner. Um, so, lo más para que sepan todos de que tenemos audífonos para ayudarles y si quieren, well, we don't have headphones. Sí. sí. Y luego si van a hablar en otro idioma, al, al menos de inglés, les vamos a dar doble el tiempo para que puedan traducir la información correctamente. So, we will move on to our public speak, our public comment. First speaker for tonight will be Lori Mallett. Lori will be followed by Tiffany Rogers. Good evening. I appreciate this opportunity to speak with you all today and to be able to have a courageous conversation with you all. 
You see, I've been attending Beyond Diversity trainings this year provided by Fort Worth ISD, and I'm serving as an equity leader at my campus. Through this training, we are encouraged to look at the world around us through the lens of racial equity and to become aware of the systemic racism that is present in all aspects of our lives each and every day. With that in mind, I feel compelled to speak out about the proposed boundary lines that will affect my campus. While I understand the intent of fixing a broken feeder pattern, I do have to question as to how that corresponds with the district's number one goal of improving student outcomes. South Hills Elementary is a neighborhood school. Many of our students walk to school. We don't have buses. We have a diverse population. And most importantly, we have immense community support and involvement. Our students currently feed into McLean Middle School, which is the closest middle school to our campus. Proximity is of utmost importance to our families, as a number of our parents don't drive or have consistent, reliable transportation. I have to wonder how parental involvement and likewise student success would be ultimately declined if our students are mandated to attend a middle school that is over three miles away and on the other side of the interstate from our neighborhood. It will most definitely limit the access of our families to this school and its resources. In the boundary presentation, it was stated that the outcome of the new boundary lines would be high quality programs in every neighborhood and community pride. We already have both of these at South Hills Elementary, and it feels like this proposal will actually take these things away from our students and our families. I am sure that you can all understand my concerns regarding this proposal, since it appears that the schools most affected are the schools with more diverse populations. It seems there are other campuses that could be diverted to other middle schools, and I wonder what other options you have as a board to redraw the boundary lines in a more equitable manner. I have watched the board's video embracing visionary leadership, and I know you pride yourselves on diversity. I've heard descriptive phrases like level the playing field and equity warrior. It was stated that input from the community informs decision making by the board, so please hear our input and our concerns. I implore you all to reconsider the proposals that affect South Hills Elementary. There must be other options for changing the boundary lines that do not alienate our families and our students at South Hills. Please demonstrate to us that you are invested in our students' outcomes and successes. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Tiffany Rogers. Tiffany will be followed by Diana Gomez. Good evening. I'll introduce myself for those in the audience that may not know me. My name is Tiffany Rogers, and I am the Fort Worth ISD Council of PTA's president. Our council of PTA supports the 69 local campus units in our district. Thank you for hearing me tonight. Trustees, tonight you will hear some passionate pleas regarding the boundary change proposal. And while I cannot speak to either side of the issue, I am here to express thanks for the process. In Fort Worth ISD's past life, decisions were voted on and then the public was informed. And I mention this because many of you are new to the board and I think it's pertinent information for you to better understand where some spe speakers experience with the district is. The process that has unfolded around the 1920 proposed boundary changes has been unprecedented and personally appreciated. Thank you, Dr. Scribner, your team, and to you trustees for spending the better part of your year listening to the communities. Fort Worth ISD Council of PTAs had a presence at each of the 13 forums and several of the follow-up forums. We heard the unified message that was presented to each pyramid. And what we found at each forum was the district's commitment to listen. There was transparency at each forum and the process was courageous. While some parts of the district seemed to have more at stake, you listened and did not pretend that this would be easy. I believe that when a person's most valuable assets, in a parent's case their children, is at felt to be at stake, it's easy to be fearful to try and protect the status quo. Whichever way the vote turns out this evening, PTA appreciates that you are leading change by envisioning a better way, a better solution, and better student outcomes, and approaching it with determination and an open mind, knowing that it will be messy at times. From forum to forum, I was witness to the fact that changes were made when they could be after listening to the community. 
Our commitment as council to help make every child's potential a reality by engaging and empowering families and communities to advocate for all children will remain the same, whether in easy times or more challenging times. We are committed as a council to walk through this process alongside our PTAs and to help better partner with the district to increase student outcome. Our desire is for every school in Fort Worth ISD to be great. Dr. Scribner, I remember you saying at several of the forums that we shouldn't have just one strong pyramid or one premier school, that you desire to make each school strong and to make offerings across the di district equitable. And that vision of equity is appreciated. The time has come to make decisions and move forward, and I encourage you to search your convictions and make the decision that will help to make every child's potential a reality. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Next, we have Diana Gomez. Diana will be followed by Lorena Gomez. Hello, my name is Diana Gomez, and I'm, I'm here not only as a parent because my son attends South Hills Elementary or because I'm a taxpayer and I have property in the Rosemont area, but also because I am a teacher at South Hills Elementary. I am here advocating for my son, my students, and my community. We recently had a muted, uh, meeting at our school, and it, we were told uh, numerous times that we were at D campus, and that because we were at D campus, we should go to another campus that was a D campus. Not all of us teachers can work at campuses where the parents are lawyers and doctors, like Tanglewood or Westcliff Elementary. Those schools don't have to worry about getting a, uh, affected by the boundary issues because their money automatically gets them into the best schools. But how about those teachers that work at the Title I schools and our school dynamic is completely different? How about those 10 students I had to comfort the day of the election well, when Trump was voted in because they were scared that their parents were going to be sent back to Mexico? Or how about that student that after a lesson on drugs and alcohol, she told me that her mom drinks with men to make money, a job a lot of undocumented women have to deal with. Or let me tell you about the time I had a math lesson and we were talking about time. And I asked the child, what time do you wake up? He said, I wake up at 3 because my mom needs to be at work by 4. And I asked him, what time do you go to sleep? I go to sleep at 10 because my mom picks me up at grandma's. Mom works two jobs to pay and make all bills at the end of the day. We at the South Hills are fighting different fights than those teachers at Tanglewood, West Cliff or Lily B. Clayton. But even with all those added pressures, our children are facing, our kids come to school to learn and sometimes to receive that daily hug and affection that one person shows them at, in, at South Hills. Wasn't that the point of the first five that we were given at our curriculum by the school district, that we should support and care for our students? We, are, we were told recently at a recent boundary meeting that our school needed more parental involvement at our school. What he, he doesn't know is all those extra hours our, our parents put into activities like cutting, coloring, making copies, they don't all have to be at school to make it be parent involved. Maybe that person doesn't realize that many of our whole households are two home incomes where both parents are working to make ends meet. Maybe he doesn't realize that many of our parents don't even know how to read or write and can't help their children with their schoolwork. I still help parents to this very day read messages or letters that they receive from students I have in the eighth grade. This, what you see here, is uh, the dedication of three teachers that came together that wanted to unify our community and let them inform them. That is the purpose of our of being teachers, informing our community. Thank you. So next we have Lorena Gomez. Hi, good evening. My name is Lorena Gomez. I have a child who attends South Hills Elementary. Um, I am a concerned parent about the whole uh, boundaries uh, that is going on. I know this change will affect my son from attending McLean Middle School. Um, they will be attending Witchwood Middle School. I live right by the highway, 820. My child will be walking to school. So he would be walking in the, in the highway. I don't know if that's not a concern to you guys, but to me it is. 
Um, I would like to also know how would this benefit my son who is a child with special needs because I never saw anything on a graph that this will, you know, this will be a change or an implement more help in classrooms. Any resource, you know, for those kids. I would like for you, um, and I'm begging you, to please understand and start focusing on the needs of these kids. Um, you have third graders who are star testing without being able to read, and to me, that's a concern. I want the best education for my child. I know his potential is also required, but how are you and every board member helping every child achieve their goals? At this time, I almost feel like because my child struggles, y'all have no choice but just to see him fail. He can work up, up to potential, he just needs resources to get him there. Can we focus that on, instead of numbers and a feeding pattern that is not going to resolve our grade level in every school, nor see our children succeed? The No Child Left Behind Act is not being prioritized at this time. That's how I feel. So next we have Scott Owen. Scott Owen will be followed by Veronica Lopez. I'd like to thank you for listening to us today. Uh, my name is Scott Owen. I'm 52 years old. I'm a decorated U.S. Army vet. I'm a, an Eagle Scout. I'm a Greenpeace member. I'm a lifetime member of General Will. I've lived in the South Hills area for 25 years now. It's my home. I come to you today on behalf of my daughter, Scotty Lee Owen. My daughter is a first grader in South Hills Elementary as an honor roll student. She's an honor roll student because she's received such excellent education at South Hills Elementary. I didn't know much about the school board, so I went online to see what your motto was and what your goals were. You have a motto, singleness of purpose. You have a mission, preparing all students for success in college, career, and community leadership. You have a vision, igniting in every child a passion for learning. You have values, student achievement, leadership development, respect for diversity, perseverance and commitment, continual improvement. I'd like to focus on continual improvement as I feel that should be the primary goal of all educators. Um, during Dr. Schreiber's re recent visits to our school, he brought three plans. One is to leave us alone, and two, that we're eventually going to make it worse by his own admission. Um, during the morning session, he inferred since we are a D-rated school, this really shouldn't upset us. Are we not entitled to continuous improvement? In all boundary meetings, all board members should be present. This was not the case. How can you understand our concerns or see us if you're not there present? The overwhelming response, the overwhelming response was to leave us alone. And, um, you know, that was uh, people floated out the doors. It was full. Um, so why are we changing? We want to close Rosemont Elementary uh, because they are underutilized. Uh, they currently have 550 students with a teacher-to-student ratio of 16 to 1. That happens to also be the national average, 16 to 1. South Hills is 22 to 1. Um, during this meeting about boundaries and moving kids around, one thing became apparent, that nobody brought a plan to the table to make our students' lives better. They were either going to leave it the same or make it worse. Are we not entitled to continuous improvement? Um, our teachers are forced through contractual obligations to remain silent on this issue. I would like to call for this to be changed, so that teachers should be able to speak their mind and speak what they say. Who more important or who would know more about our children's education than these teachers? In closing, I'd like to call for a stop to the vote and for a new plan to be written that improves everyone's lives. And if it, affects, if it hurts anyone's lives, that a new plan should be written. Um, it's uh, the one job of the school board you know, to have the best interests of our children at stake. And you know, I'd like you all to, to do what you all promised and to help our children with continual improvement. Thank you. Next, we have Veronica Lopez. Veronica will be followed by Maria Garcia. Good evening. My name is Veronica Lopez, and I am here to speak be on behalf of my neighborhood, my community, the families who feel like they have no voice, and most importantly, the children who will be affected by the proposed boundary changes if passed. I have three grown children who attended South Hills Elementary and McLean Middle School. Because of the diversity of McLean Middle School, my children were able to witness other walks of life. The friendships they made, the social skills they learned, and the education they received is what I believed helped them fulfill their dreams of attending a four-year college and earning their bachelor's degree. 
What my children learned is how to work, interact, and socialize with other children and adults of different race and class. My children are now sewing back into their community by their volunteer work, their work in education, and using their testimony to encourage others and give hope. I feel like moving our children out of McLean Middle School is modern day segregation. After researching this topic, this is what I learned. Children with more exposure to people of other races are less likely to stereotype and more likely to seek out diverse experiences as adults, which I can say this is true in the lives of my children. White students have lower exposure to students of other races than any other group of students, which makes me believe that we not only need them, they need us. I feel your job as a board member and superintendent should be to create classrooms and communities that proportionately reflect the makeup of our society and ensure equal access to opportunities for all races, regardless of race and class. I read online what you say the Fort Worth ISD school board stands for. One, to foster good community relations. Two, to develop and improve the educational system. I do not see how moving us, South Hills Elementary, out of McLean fosters good community relations or improves the educational system. Your, propo your proposal does the opposite of what you say you stand for. I am asking you to leave things as they are. Keep South Hills going where they have been going for over 30 years. How about move the other students in the Fairmount area to the middle school that they belong to. Daggett Middle School is closer to them than driving all the way or taking a bus all the way to McLean Middle School. There are other schools that you can look at besides South Hills Elementary. I close with a quote from Martin Luther King. Injustice ev anywhere is a threat to justice everywhere. Thank you for the opportunity to speak. Next, we have Maria Garcia. Maria will be followed by Stephanie Saldivar. Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to be here. Uh, first of all, I'm a parent at South Hill, I mean, South Hills and McLean as well. I believe these boundaries that you're offering to change is, is not really going to benefit our students. Um, one, I also have to older kids that already graduated now were you i was there at the meeting that you were there uh, uh february 13 and you challenge us parents to be more involved and that kind of affect me as well because we are involved in our kids uh, education so i challenge you and the board to have better safety and better education for our kids now i don't have a college degree or even a high school diploma it's very hard for me to even be standing here but you know what I said I have to I have to because my kids are gonna I want them to graduate it my parents did not know anything I know a little bit I want my kids to graduate graduate and have a better education and get a, a high um, degree I want them to be a doctor uh, a lawyer, even a superintendent or somebody, you know, I'm not nobody, but I'm a parent that have a voice for my kids and my community. So this, the, what you offer is not acceptable for us. So I would offer you to offer another plan that will work for us. So I'm sorry, I, I mean, I don't know what else to say. This, this does not work. You challenge me. I do volunteer in my school on um, both of them. I challenge you to have a better safety for our kids' campus and a better education. That, to bring them from a grade D to an A. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Stephanie. Stephanie will be followed by Gloria Uyo, I believe. My apologies if I mispronounced. Hi. Um, my name is Stephanie, and I'm here to speak for my kids. I have four. Uh, one attend McLean, and the other two attend uh, South Hill Cemetery, five for um, first grade. Um, I think what you guys are doing, it's, 
are doing it just in behalf of the people. It, I'm sorry. It's, I, I came prepared, but I, I don't know. I'm sorry. What I want to say is that I'm not okay with this. Uh, it's affecting my kids' education because you're not giving them the same equal education that you're offering to other, to other campuses. Um, I want to say that if you're basing your boundaries on the distances of the schools, I'm going to say that uh, South Hills Elementary is 1.6 miles away from McLean, while Lily B is 3.1 miles away from uh, McLean. Lily B has that middle school 1.2 miles away from them, and we have Westwood uh, Middle School from 2.1 miles away, and we need to cross I-20. Um, you say that uh, it's 13 pyramids, 13 pyramids, and in that you list the schools that Northside, Rufino Mendez, War Heights, South Hills, and Diamond Hills. What these three schools have in common is they're mainly Latinos. So I feel like my kids are being discriminated. So I beg you to please stop this voting right now and to listen to what we have to say and put that in the new, in a new uh, proposed boundary because this is not acceptable. We want to fight for this. We want to do everything it takes to stop this because my kids, our kids, deserve the best education too. Thank you. We have Gloria up next, last name U-L-L-O-A. Gloria's not here, or Gloria? Okay, and Gloria will be followed by Auro Valenzuela. Hello, my name is Gloria Ulloa. Thank you for having me here today and giving me the opportunity to express my point to all of you. I would like to start out by saying that I used to live in 35 Wrigley on the other side. And uh, when I got pregnant of my first child, um, I talked to my husband, and uh, we decided to move to another neighborhood. And we did our researches uh, because we wanted our children to be better educated. So we moved on and started looking for a house, and we did finally found it. Um, we've been living in our house. We moved in to our house in 2005, and we've been living there for 15 years already. Um, we moved there for the first reason because um, I wanted my kids to attend to the certain school that they belong to. And um, it was hard to find it, but we find it. We have noticed that our property taxes are going up. They're increasing a lot. We are paying over $4,000 right now. And as far as I know, all the taxes go to the schools around it, around us, um, as well as hospitals and police departments and et cetera. But the main point is, uh, why is this decision about relocating our children? And why am I paying taxes for a school that my kids were not longer allowed to attend? Um, um, also, um, I invested on my children's future. I invested on a home that I'm living in. Um, I know and I understand that I don't have a house of half a million dollars, but I, we are working hard to live in that house, to own that property. And um, one question that we brought up to Dr. Scribner that day that we had our gathering in South Hills, um, I'm sorry to say this, but uh, we just received a response of shattering your shoulders like you didn't care about our community. We also feel like you guys need to sit down and listen to our community first before making another vote. And I propose to stop the vote until new boundaries have been developed and to show that you all elected board members are listening to our community. Thank you. Next we have, I believe it's Auro Valenzuela. Auto Valenzuela will be followed by Dr. Jared Williams. Buenas tardes. Uh, good afternoon. Mi nombre es Aaron Valenzuela. My name is Aaron Valenzuela. 
Tengo dos hijas en South Hills. I have two daughters in South Hills. Y una en McLean. And one in McLean. Y no estoy de acuerdo en los cambios que la mesa directiva. And I am not in, to, in agreement with the, you know, the director. Está proponiendo. They're, uh, they are proposing. Para nuestros hijos. For, for our kids. Esos cambios no se han aprobado. These changes haven't been approved. Y ya están afectando emocionalmente a mis hijas. And emotionally, my daughters have been affected. Porque quieren ir a la escuela donde va su hermana mayor. Because they want to go to the school where their older uh, sister goes, which is McLean. Por todos los programas que tiene McLean. For all the programs that McLean provides. Y están afectadas. And they are affected already. Tengo una en segundo grado. I have a one in second grade. Una en cuarto. One in fourth grade. Y la otra va a entrar este, eh, al otro año. And the other one uh, next year will be in... Siguiente año. Ne ne following year. Y no se sienten seguras por los cambios. And they are insecure about the changes. Y es mi responsabilidad como padre venir delante de ustedes. And it's my responsibility as a, a parent to come in, in front of you. Para decirles, por favor. To ask you, please. Que reflexionen. To reflect. Este cambio. Uh, about this change. Porque está afectando a nuestros hijos. Because it is affecting our kids. Emocionalmente. Emotionally. Gracias. Thank you. Thank you. Next we have Dr. Jared Williams. Dr. Jared Williams will be followed by Robert Rogers. Good evening, Dr. Scribner, President Ramos, uh, members of the board. Uh, my name is Dr. Jared Williams, and I'm here to speak um, both on behalf of Leadership ISD, a nonprofit focused on advancing racial equity um, and academic excellence in public education, and also as a public education advocate, also um, focused on doing the same thing. Um, first, I'd like to just honor and um, celebrate each of you for um, your like steadfast commitment uh, to focusing on student outcomes, specifically through the lens of racial equity. Um, that's not often um, happening across the state um, and across the nation. Um, and so I celebrate uh, your efforts and your work um, in continuing to um, move forward, especially in difficult times and difficult conversations around racial equity in public education. Um, I also want to honor um, your steadfast commitment um, to all of our vision to prepare um, all students for success. Um, and not only just preparing them for success, but preparing them to achieve uh, their boldest aspirations. Um, as an advocate for advancing racial equity and academic excellence, I'm also here to give public comment, um, especially um, with uh, two very important um, conversations and decisions that you will be making over the next hours, days, and uh, months. Um, but first, I'd like to just share a personal story. Um, over my past 30 years of lived experience um, as a black man um, and also as an education advocate, um, what I found is that um, oftentimes the quality of education um, is too often tied to the color of our skin um, and where we happen to live. Um, me personally, my parents uh, moved uh, my family um, to another space, um, another educational setting, um, still in public education, but through the hopes of providing high quality education. And although that's a privilege, um, that shouldn't be so, and many of our students don't have that decision. And so um, we know that, especially for our black and brown students here in Fort Dicey, that's especially not so. When we look at the data, 30, there's a 36% gap um, between our black students and their white counterparts. We also know that there's a 26% gap between our Latinx students um, and their white peers um, on all um, subjects tested across all grades and STAR. Um, and that shouldn't be so. And so um, over the next couple hours, days, um, you'll be making conversations and decisions 
around two particular areas. One, around updating your student outcome goals, which are so critical to closing racial disparities. And two, around um, considering how do we begin to align uh, strategically and equitably our resources um, across the district, um, particularly with the boundaries conversation. And so um, we've been working with community members, educators, and we just ask that um, you, you adopt these um, racial equity policies um, that continue to advance um, that work. Thank you. Thank you. Robert Rogers and Robert Rogers will be followed by Stephen Poole. Good evening. Uh, thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight. I would like for you to spend a minute uh, imagining with me two sets of parents that will attend Kindergarten Roundup this spring. One family is white, the other is black. They will be in different neighborhood schools. The parents of the white child ask the principal of their neighborhood school how likely it is that their student will be reading at grade level in third grade because they have learned that that is an important predictor of the success of their student in their academics and in life. The principal replies that for the past five years, nine out of 10 white students in their school have been reading at grade level in third grade. So in a class of 20 white students, they could expect 18 would be reading at grade level. My two-year-old granddaughter lives in that neighborhood school district. At a different school in another neighborhood, parents of a black child ask the same question of their principal in their neighborhood school. The school's principal replies that in the past five years, no more than one in 10 black students were reading at grade level in third grade. So in a class of 20 black students in that class, they could predict that two would be reading at grade level and 18 would not. I tutor reading in that school. It is beyond obvious that we are not fulfilling our pledge to ensure that all children have an adequate education. I strongly encourage you to pay attention to the policy recommendations that were presented by Leadership ISD. We need to frequently and seriously review data on racial disparity in the district. We need to make sure that we are allocating resources and making sure that our most qualified and best teachers are in the schools that need them the most. And we need to do the best to make sure that our students are ready to learn when they hit kindergarten by providing <laughs> adequate, high-quality pre-K child care services in the neighborhoods that need them the most. Thank you for your time. Next, we have Stephen Poole. Stephen Poole will be followed by Felix Martinez. Good evening, members of the board, uh, Mr. Ramos and Dr. Scribner. Uh, I wanted to talk a little bit about the events that occurred at Rosemont Middle School today. Uh, Five staff, three students, and one police officer was injured. Four students were charged with assault on a police officer. And a district spokesperson said it was a scuffle. And after being locked down and then a lockout, by 11 a.m., the school operations returned to normal. I saw the video a student provided to the Star Telegram of the brawl. It was not a scuffle. And I will wager any bet that operations didn't return to normal, and that not a, a lot of quality learning occurred at Rosemont Middle School this afternoon. And that's unacceptable. Our students deserve better. Our parents who s send our students to our schools to be safe deserve better, and our staff deserve better. When will the district stop minimizing and normalizing this chaos that is occurring at a lot of our schools? Our phones rang off the hook from teachers today, concerned not only from the teachers at Rosemont, but their own campuses, asking and saying, this occurs at my school, it just doesn't hit the news. I have an ongoing dialogue with Dr. Scribner on a lot of issues going on in this district, and we had a conversation about this this afternoon. I know we can do better as a district and I'm willing to work with him and you all and everyone in this community to do better for our students, to do better for our parents, and to do better for our staff on all campuses, not just Rosemont Middle. Thank you very much. Our last and final speaker for this evening is Felix Martinez.
Good evening. Um, again, my name is Felix Martinez, and I want to thank you for letting me speak this evening. And I want to talk on behalf on the, on the boundary changes that are impacting our, our South Hills Elementary School. Um, I'm here more or less as an advocate, as a voice for, the, for our smallest citizens in the city of Fort Worth and Fort Worth ISD, which is our children. Our children are being, from one of the proposals that uh, Mr. Scribner proposed, is that our children will be, will be crossing Highway 20, and it seems to us that while they're being bus or going to be bus to, um, to Highway 20, it's like a more or less another way of modern-day segregation especially since our children, 90%, are Latino. Additionally, what are, what's more concerning is that Dr. Scribner came to our school and presented a proposal where I know he has his, where he was saying he has his heart in, in the children, that he has another proposal for another school, that the students are crossing Highway 30, and he wants to stop that. Yes, that's wonderful, but then why do you want our students to cross, cross another major highway, Highway 20? Please, I, I plead on you to please, and I pray for God that you make the right decision for our children. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for sharing your thoughts this evening. We will now move from public comment to number five, reports and presentations on the Texas Academic Performance Report. Dr. Scribner, would you like to say a few words before the report? Thank you very much, uh, President Ramos. So tonight we will hear from uh, Sarah Rispi, uh, our Associate Superintendent in Data Quality. Uh, also, Michael Steiner, Assistant Superintendent in uh, Student Support Services, and our Chiefs of Elementary, uh, Secondary, uh, Academics, and Equity. Uh, I'll go ahead and turn that over now to uh, Sarah Rispi. Thank you, Dr. Scribner. Good evening, President Ramos, board members. I'm happy to be here tonight to talk to you about our uh, annual report on the Texas annual performance. Um, this public hearing is required under state law annually, and the data that you'll see will not be new to you. You've seen many of these data before, but they come out in a different <coughs> format from TEA, and so we'll go over that this evening. Um, you'll remember that Texas annual performance report or taper hold on I didn't turn the clicker on sorry about that um, comes out online on the TEA website there is a huge online report that um, anyone can go to and see any district or school in the state um, and then there's a shorter 26 page shorter PDF version and that's what we go over in the meeting each year as a part of that legal requirement the taper can be accessed on the TEA site. We also post it on our website at the district. And parents or community members who need a copy can also get those at a campus. Any one of our campuses would be happy to help with that. So for the district report, um, we start off with our accountability. Our accountability rating this year, we had 79%, which gave us a C in the state system. Um, we are accredited, and then we are in our special ed determination was needs intervention. That's based in part on uh, students served by special ed performance in STAR, their graduation rate, and so forth. And we'll see some of those data coming up in the presentation. Um, there are a number of topics covered in the taper report annually, and you see some of those in front of you. Uh, one of those is our student ethnic distribution, and there are a lot of comparisons between <coughs> districts in the state. And so you see before you the comparison of Fort Worth ISD <coughs> student population uh, with Texas. You'll notice that we have about 10% more Hispanic students than the state, about 10% more African American students than the state, and about 16% less white students. So a different diversity here in Fort Worth ISD when compared to the state of Texas. Um, we also look at student enrollment by program compared to the state. Um, here you'll see on that first uh, dark bar that the Fort Worth ISD has a much greater number of bilingual and ESL students than the state of Texas, 32% uh, compared to about 20%. We also have slightly more CTE students. Those are career and technical education students. We have 
more gifted and talented students identified in Fort Worth ISD, 11.8% compared to 8% at the state, and then about the same number of special ed students. For gifted and talented, um, one of the questions we were asked was how that compared to the state over time. Have we always had that large difference between the districts? It's a positive difference here that we've identified more students. You'll see that that's been going up as we have worked to identify more students and provide those additional services to our students that are gifted and talented. Um, additional demographic comparisons include economic disadvantage. We are um, over 25% more economic disadvantaged students than the state. We have more English learners than the state does and more students at risk, 65 as compared to 50 for the state. Um, this slide provides a comparison, just a very broad comparison of star results to some of our urban district peers. So the first bar there at 67% is Fort Worth ISD compared to Dallas, Austin, Houston, and San Antonio, which are also urban districts uh, in the state. Not all urban districts are equal. Even though we are all urban, some look very different. So to give you some extra context, if you compare the economic disadvantaged, uh, Texas is at about 61%. Our district, as we saw, is about 86%. So a big difference there. But also you'll see a difference between Fort Worth and Austin, that dark gray bar. Austin has about 54% economically disadvantaged, but that's a huge difference compared to uh, Fort Worth and some of the other urbans. The blue bar shows you the difference in number of English learners served by the different districts and then the pink bar is the special ed population in each of the urban districts and you'll see some differences there as well. Um, attendance here is compared for the district and we put the little tree on the district bar so it's easy for you to see the third one in there. Um, our overall attendance was 94.5%. You've got the state, the region, and then just Fort Worth ISD mm -hmm. by the different student groups. We've got our African American, Hispanic, and white, as well as some of our special populations. Um, you'll notice on this that there's pretty consistent among most of those with a slightly lower percentage for our African American students. Um, annual dropout rate, and this is for 7th and 8th graders, so at the middle school level, you have the state, the region, the district at 1.4%, and then by student group um, on the bars following that. You'll notice that African American is a little bit over the district, Hispanic is a little bit under. Um, that two or more group is students who identify with more than one race. It's a low number of students for us, about 65 students, I believe, mm -hmm. in that. Um, the annual dropout rate at high school, so for grades 9 through 12 within that one school year, this is the state, region, and then the district at 2.9, and the various student groups as well there. Um, on that, the special ed and EL, I wanted to point out that those are higher. They are smaller numbers of students overall. So given that we had a, about 23,000 students enrolled there, that represents about 100 special ed students and slightly more with the ELs. But the number difference is important as well. This is the four-year longitudinal graduation cohort. So this is based on students who started high school as a ninth grader in the 2014-15 school year and then following them through to the class of 2018. This represents about 4,900 students um, in the all students bar there. You'll see the bottom part, 87.4% graduated. 0.5% uh, there had a high school equivalency degree. Some, 2.6, continue on in school and then 9.6% were dropouts. Um, you see that by the racial groups as well. Um, I want to point out the special ed bar that we have a really large band there of continuers, 15.7%. Many of those students enrolled in high school with a six-year plan based on their individual educational plan. So that was planned for them to continue on, and they would be in the six-year graduation rate if we looked at that. We have here the, our 
college career and military ready graduates. Uh, the bottom part of the bar represents those who met a college readiness indicator like ACT, SAT, maybe they had dual credit or earned an associate's degree while in high school. The top part is the career and military readiness portion. Those students would have done something like earning an industry certification, having a, a special ed student who graduated with their IEP and were workforce ready, or maybe enlisted in the military or represented there. So you see the district bar, um, we had a larger percent that were college ready, and then another percent that were career and military ready. And you can see that for the various ethnic groups as well. Um, again here, that special ed bar is slightly different because many of those students do graduate under IEP with workforce readiness or an advanced degree. And so those are considered career and military ready students. Um, this is our class of 18 average SAT scores on all subjects combined. Um, you can see the state average, the region average, and the district average. Um, I want to remind the board that um, you have supported us for the last few years in giving the school day SAT. So unlike the state and the region where students who plan to go to college opt in and take the SAT, for Fort Worth ISD, all students take the, get the opportunity to take the SAT. We do that during a school day so that we don't have students who are unable to come on a Saturday or pay. It's given to all students promote equity. So our number reflects that inclusion of every student in the district in class of 2018. Um, for the average SAT, again, we've got state, region, and district. You'll notice that these are more comparable. These are opt-in students. So these are students who opted to take the SAT, uh, sorry, the ACT. The district has begun offering the ACT in school day, but that was not happening with the class of 18. Um, the next slide gives us some staff information. So this is our teacher ethnic distribution. Um, you'll notice that Fort Worth ISD has a little more than double the number of African American teachers than the state of Texas has in general. We have, are slightly underrepresented on Hispanic when compared to the state and uh, Anglo teachers as well. For years of experience with teachers, um, you'll see that we're pretty comparable. There's a sl we have slightly more one to five year teachers, but otherwise fairly comparable with the state of Texas. I'm gonna turn it over to Mr. Steinert to walk us through the next part. So in shifting to look at discipline, last year Fort Worth ISD had a total of 595 violent or criminal incidents. And those are spread across the four categories you see in front of you with 171 felonies, 240 misdemeanors, 10 firearms offenses, and 174 assaults. That was up 10% across all categories from the previous year. This slide shows you a little bit longer trend line with the top line being pl students placed in our district alternative educational campuses. So those are Insights Elementary for third, fourth, and fifth graders, Middle Level Learning Center, and Metro Opportunity High School. This past year, and those offenses include um, violations of student code of conduct as well as criminal offenses on and off campus. So this past year we had 837 offenses uh, down from 877 last year that led to DAEP placement. The bottom trend line are those most serious offenses for students that are actually placed at the county juvenile, ju juvenile justice alternative education probation level. Um, this year that went up to 81 from 65 the previous year, so a pretty significant increase. And in talking with our partners at Tarrant County Juvenile Probation as well as the City of Fort Worth Police Department, that mirrors what we're seeing in the broader community. <clears throat> this breakdown shows you the ethnic distribution of those kids sent to our district alternative sites. So Fort Worth ISD on the left versus the state on the right. We can see in the turquoise wedge that we are disproportionate in our placement of African-American students. That's why it's underlined and you can see the number of incidents, 410 of those 837 total placements last year were African-American students, so more than twice our enrollment. The good news or the bright spot there is that that's actually down 6% from what we saw the previous year. We had 55% in that number. 
When we look at the smaller number of more serious offenses, the 81 JJAEP placements, the African-American representation dropped significantly there from 58 percent last year to 31 percent, still disproportionate, still more than our 22 percent enrollment. On the Hispanic side, that went up slightly, so we're also disproportionate there with our Hispanic students. When we look at out-of-school suspensions, this number last year of 13,400 plus suspensions, I want to refer to as suspension events, meaning that there were 13,400 incidents where a student was put out of school. We can have a student that can be suspended more than one time in a given year. So we call those unduplicated students. So last year, we had about 6,900 students that accounted for 13,400 plus suspensions. Of those suspensions, they led to either one, two, or three-day out-of-school suspension placements, which accounted for 27,500 lost instructional days. If we look at it broken down by grade level, the smallest percentage were our littlest kids, pre-K through third grade, and that was about 673 students. And you may remember that the state changed a law and the board adopted a policy that restricted our suspension and out-of-school placement for those littlest kids. With that, though, there's a caveat that students who violate at a high enough level in relation to assaults, weapons offenses, or drug offenses, if it's in the interest of their safety and the safety of other students, we can still suspend them. And so that's what those 673 incidents are there. We had another 1,200 or so fourth and fifth graders. Um, the vast majority of our students, and this continues to be the trend, um, are middle school students that we suspend. It was 60 plus percent last year, or two years ago, 59 percent last year and then followed by 27% high school students. If we look at the ethnicity by grade level breakdown, at the elementary level, we had about 1,800 students suspended. 66% of those incidents were African-American students. So that's where we see our highest level of disproportionality. And this data is data that each of our individual campuses get on a six-week basis. So they're working individually to address these issues at the campus level. At the middle school, it's about 50% of our students are African-American that are suspended and at the high school 56 percent. And then we go even deeper to talk about gender and ethnicity because we know that's important in our equity work. So 65 percent of the kids suspended last year were male with 35 percent female. If we look at the female side there, there were 5,300 events. About 3,000 of those events involved an African-American girl. Um, if you look at the bottom of the page, you can see that our African-American female enrollment in Fort Worth ISD is about 22% of all of our girls, a little over 9,000 girls. So when I dig deeper on the data on the 57% of African-American girls, it ends up being about 1,200 students that account for 3,000 suspensions. So one in seven of our African-American girls last year were impacted by a suspension. On the male side, it was 52%. That actually amounted to, when we look at the unduplicated number of kids, it was about 1,200. One in four of our African-American boys were impacted by suspension last year. Another part of the uh, taper report that we won't go into, but I know that you have heard this from our chief financial officer, is our PEAMS financial report where we had a, a great rating there. So that's a link in case anyone needs it. We also hmm. wanted to include from our higher ed coordinating board some information about the class of 2017, the most recent information we have. In that class of 2017, we had 4,275 graduates. Of those, around 800 went to a Texas four-year public university. About a little under 1,200 went to a Texas two-year public university. 162 independent colleges and universities within Texas. So this is coming from Texas Higher Ed Coordinating Board. We had 461 not trackable. That means that they had a non-standard ID number when they uh, enrolled in college and it was not able to match to the high school uh, K-12 system. And then 1678 were not found. For those students, that means they were not found the fall after graduation in a Texas university. So they may not have gone to a university. They may have gone outside of Texas. They may have waited to enroll the following semester or enrolled in the military or a career. So those we don't have the information on. Um, campus plans were presented to the board back in October, and we have those linked on our district and school sites, and we'll be happy to answer any questions that the board might have. Thank you. Looks like we've got 
Toby, uh, Trustee Toby Jackson first. Thank you, President Ramos. Uh, first question is page six, top graph, looking at 2019 student enrollment comparison. We have a new electronic, and I don't know who this goes to, but we have a new electronic system to capture student enrollment. So we're looking at 85.8% socioeconomically disadvantaged. Is that number up? Because that would pay us more federal dollars, right? So is that number up? I know before we had to turn in paper, principal had to collect it. And I just want to know, is that number up? And you may not know that today. I don't have that in front of me, but I know that we have been able to better identify students and get them enrolled with all the correct information. So I feel like it is, but we could definitely respond to that compared to prior years. Yeah, if, if, if I may, so um, from from this year to last, uh, probably pretty uh, similar, but prior to going to the online registration, I think we were hovering around uh, 70, 70, 77 or yeah. 77, 78. So when we, when we went online registration, and when mom can, can or dad can, can put in all students, the, the elementary students as well as the high school students, and count them in the, in the economically disadvantaged um, category if, they, if, they, if, they, if that applied, um, we saw a, a significant increase from about 77 to 85. Thank you. And, and that does help with our title dollars. It does. It does. Uh, moving on to page 11, violent and criminal incidents, Mr. Steiner. Thank you. Your data is great. Um, I'm disappointed to see 14 percent of our young African-American females and 25 percent of our African-American males. Uh, that, that data doesn't excite me, but I like to at least see it so we have something to move forward on and to improve on. Uh, with violent and criminal incidents, we went up 5.7 percent with misdemeanors, but yet our population of students decreased. Is that correct? Yes, yes, ma'am. So and that and makes I just it wanted more. to share that our students, that uh, when students commit incidents, and don't, they don't necessarily have to happen on campus. They can happen anywhere in the city, but they still are tr uh, contributed to our uh, district data. And, and they're still our students, and we still have less of them, but our numbers are up. Uh, felonies up 6.2 percent. Misdemeanor, again, up 5.7 percent. But what troubles me really is assault is up 19 percent. So I know you all know this, but that's of, of grave concern. And uh, love to see what we're going to do to change, change those numbers. And I know this is no different than any other urban district in the state, but I think we can be better. Thank you. Next, we have Trustee Ashley Paz. We can stay right there on slide number 22 that uh, Toby was just talking about. Um, so you have, a, so broken out with felony and misdemeanor, are, what are, do we know like what the specific felonies and misdemeanor, I mean, are those broken out anyway by? We could, I, I can actually send you a, a, a spreadsheet that breaks down the number of offenses in the different codes. Now it depends on the level of offense and how it's cited by the officer on site, whether it reaches a felony level in terms of damage to property or person. So um, it's, it's a much larger chart, but I, I'd be happy to send you all a breakdown so you can see what that looks like. Okay. They don't always necessarily occur on site, though, in my No, it's true. Yeah. They, they, yeah. You know, for those that are violations of the law, they can occur off campus, yeah. but as you they said, still get a Ms. Jackson, they're still yeah. enrolled in our district, and we're still yes. responsible for them, and so it's still, we still place them. Yeah, well, I mean, we certainly can't control every, everything that happens in our students' lives, but we do know that there is a correlation to the quality of education that they're receiving, and committing these offenses either in on campus or out of campus so we are we are accountable in some way absolutely um so um on page 23 or slide 23 i guess um i know you mentioned that the increase uh in the referrals to jj aep um is consistent with what we're seeing um kind of in the community abroad, but do we, can you expand on, on that at all? Why? Are, why? So, so what we've seen, because you notice going from 16, 17 to 17, 18, we, have a, we had a 15 incident jump um, and now another 16. Uh, what we've seen when I, when I talk with our director of student discipline and placement and also with um, the folks at Tarrant County with Benny Medlin is that we see the students that are involved in incidents that are criminal tend to be more serious in nature in terms of the criminal conduct of those students. Um, and, and it has mirrored at the county level, at the city level, and, 
and we don't have, you know, we can't put our finger on the reason. We just know that we've always had kids involved in criminal conduct, but what we're seeing are much more serious criminal conduct, um, you know, with bodily harm, murder, cases like that, which are pretty high profile, so we all hear about those, but yeah. more, more so than we've ever seen in the past. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. Trustee Endor. Thank you for this report. Um, on page nine, slide number 17, uh, these are the SAT scores and ACT scores. I don't see any data for special ed populations. <clears throat> Is that because the numbers are so small or are, are special ed populations also taking the SAT? They, they, they do um, for when it's appropriate per their ARD committee recommendations. Okay. Um, and students that are recommended through their ARD to take SAT during the school day, we do offer to them. Uh, it is a smaller number, but we could provide that information to you as well. Okay, I wanna make sure that they have equal access to that. They do well. have access and it is an ARD committee decision. Okay, and are all students' uh, scores factored into these? Are, are, are we keeping data on those students who complete the test in five minutes? on those students who um, aren't necessarily based on the moni monitor's um, yes. judgment putting forth best effort. So the, the challenge for us, and I, I, I think I understand your it's question. It's an arbitrary, I mean, that's a subjective yes, call. I understand that. Um, we purposely make the decision to provide SAT during the school day because we want all of our students to have the opportunity. Absolutely. With that, any student who does sit for the test um, they are calculated into our overall score. So there are some students that, if by chance they didn't take the test as seriously as possible, they are factored into our overall average. That is where our scores look a little bit different than the state and the region. Um, there are um, a number of large urban school districts are doing SAT during the day now, but a number of other school districts do not do that, and their numbers um, would be reflective of students who are opting in as a college-ready going track as opposed to, uh, to um, our perspective of making sure all students have that opportunity. Okay. And then on um, page 13, slide number 26, um, I can't say, I mean, it, it is um, alarming to me that there were 27,515 days of lost instruction mm -hmm. due to out-of-school suspension. Mm -hmm. Because we all know that if a student is not in class they are certainly not learning what needs to be learned and that of course reflects in our overall um, scores but more importantly that affects that child's life mm -hmm. yes. okay star scores important children's lives far more important um, what and in light of Mr. Poole's comments today regarding the incidents at Rosemont Middle School, in light of the fact that I received a text yesterday from my daughter that there were fights at her middle school, not Rosemont Middle School, but at another middle school mm -hmm. in Fort Worth ISD. What programs are in place? What are we doing? What um, resources do administrators have on those campuses? in order to, um, eat, whether it's personnel on campuses or other resources, what are we doing to help mitigate this issue? So Trustee Dar, oh, no, I'll let you well first I will say that uh, safety and security has been a focus on our, at every principal's meeting. Um, we've had uh, safety and security come and present what uh, they should do as far as uh, safety uh, metal detectors, uh, ensuring that there's a protocol. We sent that out again this last uh, February's principals meeting. Uh, we asked all principals to return with a plan to reset the, for climate and culture. Um, we asked that they do at a minimum of two metal detectors a week. Um, often we don't find anything, but we want to show the kids that we can, we're consistent and we care about their safety. Um, we're also asking principals to go over their safety plan with their campus. Uh, we asked them to resubmit that to us, so we're monitoring that. We'll address that again. Um, at the beginning of the year, we ask every campus principal to turn in a plan to address discipline. We just spoke about out of school and school suspensions. Um, they were to identify, and I'm not sure if you're aware, but they have a principal's dashboard where we can see discipline data every day. Um, we ask them to identify those students that have uh, high instances of discipline, uh, and then we ask them to put a plan in place to address that. 
um, the principal is to sit with the assistant principal and ensure that they are calibrating on what the instances are and they're being consistent in the, the uh, consequences. Um, Again, even today at that instance, uh, we met with that faculty. We did a reset on what the procedure should be. Um, we will go back over again tomorrow to ensure that that process is implemented. We'll continue to monitor. We have additional uh, people on, on hand to make sure that the kids feel safe, the faculty feel safe, um, so that we, we have an orderly environment. So I expect it to look differently. And I was just going to add that in being preventative, uh, we do still continue to work with our restorative practice. And we can say that 71 schools in our district have had some level of support and training. And then more specifically, heavy support has been with 54. We currently have four specialists, one vacancy right now, and just recently hired our uh, restorative practice coordinator who happens to be here in the audience under the uh, direction and leadership of uh, Dr. Doreen Benavides. So we are continuing working with our restorative practice and this is, goes hand in hand with our racial equity work. I don't know if you all are aware but the restorative practice training does um, implement our protocol in their training so that when staff sees the protocol they see it from the racial equity lens and they also see it through the restorative practice. And you know, when we talk about racial equity, we're talking about individuals' beliefs. So this is a journey. It's, yes. We're all still continuing to grow. I can share with you that everyone, as of spring 2019, all of our campus principals had been trained through our racial equity work and should have equity um, committees on their campuses. So knowing that, thank you for all that information. I appreciate that. Knowing that, um, Behavior is often a child's way of not saying, I'm giving you a hard time, but I am having right. a hard time. Um, how are we addressing, and this is a bigger question that probably can be answered this evening, the social and emotional learning needs. That's a, that's a hot buzzword in education, social emotional learning. And it seems to me that if we're not addressing some of the social and emotional learning needs, and some of that can be addressed with restorative discipline or, or in other, other ways, but if we're not addressing those social emotional learning needs, we're not going to see the increase in better behavior right. that, we need to, that we need to be seeing and, and empowering teachers with um, tools in order to better know to get a feel for how, what, what's their class looking like today. Are we coming in hungry? Are we coming in because, you know, with a, in a bad mood because I just had a fight with my mom? Did my dog die yesterday? Uh, you know, how are we addressing some of those social and emotional learning needs? So I would offer that we recognize that this is a concern as well. And in all honesty, we are looking at how do we restructure to ensure that our kids are meeting, we're meeting those needs. We understand when a kid is suspended. Now we don't just put them out. When they come back, what do we do? So we need to re reorganize our personnel so that we ensure that we match whatever their needs are, how we're getting the resources to them, and then working with them on changing their behavior on and response, but also providing whatever it is they, they need so they don't respond that way. So we, we are not where we want we need to be, but we are looking at how do we restructure and reorganize our staff and personnel so that we're able to provide that for every campus. When I would love to see some kind of a reentry program. Yes, ma'am. You know, when you're taken out of school for six weeks mm -hmm. because you made a poor choice and these are the consequences of that poor choice, then coming back cold turkey is hard. And it's hard on the parents, it's hard on the students. So how are we facilitating conversations and a reentry process for those students to come back into the school so that they know that they are more than the sum of their behavior? Yes. And that the school is there to support them and to and to and that we believe in them to make this better so we don't so that repeat offenders are not a problem yes. so thank you i appreciate those answers next we have um trustee quentin phillips thank you president ramos um and i really do appreciate the undeniable hard work that i know it takes for y'all to put these reports together to make these presentations to us. It really is genuinely appreciated, the efforts that you're putting behind that. Um, with, this, with this particular report, um, very, very unfortunately, I think it's telling a story that we all know well, all too well. 
um, that as we look at data every time, we can see that black students are at the bottom. Um, every, every time we get one of these reports, that happens to be the case. I am very aware that we are putting new things in place to address that, and I'm appreciative of that as well. I do feel it's a new day. We're all trying to get on the same track and move in the proper direction. I guess for this particular question I have, I want to move backwards in a way, since I know that we're trying to implement solutions. And working backwards, and I would love to hear multiple perspectives if you don't mind, what in your estimation do we diagnose as the actual issue? Um, when we're talking to more, if we're talking about that we see it across the state, um, but I would love to bring that more personal, local, immediate, back to us here in Fort Worth ISD. Why is it that in our district, our black students are performing lower than their counterparts across the board, the disproportionately uh, suspended, the discipline more? What are we seeing as the diagnosis for that? I know we're implementing solutions. But maybe we just have to take a, a quick look at what the diagnosis is and really be able to be effective moving forward. And so please. I think I'll, I'll start from my personal local and immediate. I, I believe it still is about perhaps expectations we may have for children of color. And that is when we have our racial equity work and they'll go into these deep conversations. We're giving staff and <laughs> all of us in there the opportunity to explore their own biases and what are their beliefs about the students that they're serving? It's how, and it's taking time to understand how am I showing up in front of the students when I show up in that classroom every day or I show up as the principal or whatever role I may play in the district. And even, we all have biases. And I had to take time to explore and understand my own biases as well. Uh, but I, I, that's what I believe. It's still about the expectations. And what I didn't say about our restorative practice is about when I say preventative, it's about building the relationships. And I think that is missing. Students will, what is it, what is the saying? Students won't, don't care what you know until they, they know that you care. I really believe that even though we say it, I think that's really true. They have to know that we genuinely care. And um, well, I think that's all I'll say right now. I don't wanna... Mr. Phillips, if I can just add one thing. Um... I think it goes back to a conversation we had um, a few weekends ago when we were talking about goal setting. And the direction that we have to go is not just the academic program, but it's the academic experience for our students. Um, what is the experience our, our, our students have as they go through their years of, of, of schooling? Um, connectedness is the word that came to my mind when you asked the question, what is the, what is the root cause of where we're at? What are we doing to connect our students to the experience they're having in our schools, academically, socially? Um, just what, what is that experience for our students? Um, and what is our expectation of our students? And what is our belief in our students? And so we need to go back and reflect, um, speaking from uh, uh, an academic perspective, we need to go back and look at what our program is, um, how we're challenging our students, how we're providing opportunity for our students to um, enroll in courses that connect to their interest, um, and also challenge them at the same time and prepare them for what comes next. Uh, but then make sure that we're supporting our teachers and how do we connect with our students in these opportunities to not just say, here is your learning experience, but here is your whole schooling experience. And it's more than just what you learn, it's the experience you go through um, while, while you're at school. So there's my belief about what the root cause is and where we're going with that, um, those new steps for academic programming. I want to I want to just add from my perspective in data that um, <clears throat> I appreciate and the fact that the board has pressed us about always bringing forward the data and then looking at it by student groups and we've not always done that and so I I think that the in looking back at where we have been sometimes if you don't look at things what gets measured gets action taken and um, we need to be looking at that and then also the board has taken a lead in having those conversations and expecting staff to be open and willing to have those conversations as well and so I think that um, if there were an easy answer probably districts everywhere would have done it I don't think that there's an easy answer but I think that having the conversation starts us on the path to finding those solutions I would agree like that I think that get it go ahead I'm no, I would think looking back at, at the hard work that we've done up to this point 
one thing that it all has in common, whether we're talking about positive behavioral supports, multi-tiered systems of support, our equity work, our restorative practices work, all of that has one thing in common, in common and it's about systemic cultural change. <clears throat> and it's ultimately about changing adult behaviors and the way the adults interact with students. And our district is deeply invested in the trauma-informed work and the adverse childhood experience work with TCU. And one thing we know from that is that the more trauma that our students have experienced, the more important it is for them to find an adult at that campus that they can connect to, that they know cares about them, to Ms. Starr's point. And sometimes that's hard when these kids present to us in a very aggressive way. And I think that's what we're working on, is helping our adults understand, how do I help make that <clears throat> connection and not exacerbate the distance that exists between the adults and the kids? Indeed. Last thing I just wanted to share is that uh, from reflecting on what my colleagues shared is Mr. Steiner and I were having a conversation this afternoon about the data, and I don't think there's a one-size-fits-all response. I do agree with the academic experience piece. Uh, just uh, this week we've been talking about how are leaders taking these trainings, whether they, they're based on equity or TBRI based on behavioral response, and increasing structures at the school to create houses or cross-functional teams to support those relationships because when adults care at the campus then they'll care about the kids so how do we create and foster the the, the leaders of the campuses and I think Dr. Washington and I, and I are working on really redesigning student services so that we can yes. create those fostering relationships but actual actionable structures mm -hmm. that will sustain themselves so that we can have adults that care and then really they will care about the kids. And so. equity. Yeah. Absolutely. No, I, I definitely appreciate those answers, and I don't think I heard anything that I disagree with. So, uh, so just briefly recapping, what what I heard is that we must strengthen our expectations, lift our expectations of what we have on our students. Um, we must build and strengthen those relationships. Um, I would think that would be across the board, um, particularly at our campus levels, uh, strengthening those relationships enhancing the academic experience that these young people are getting, um, better support our teachers, so, and ch systemic cultural change, which I wholeheartedly agree with. And I mean, and that's all of us, all of us are part of this system right now. And, um, and we have to work on adults. Mm -hmm. yeah. We have to have adults that care. And if we already have those adults that care, we have to be those adults that care. Got so um, I just wanted to get that out there for all of us, because I mean, that's a, uh, it's a big amen for me, and I think that when we hear it, when we say it out loud, it holds each of us accountable to making sure that we're focused on those being the things that we're working on. Last point, and then I'll yield back to my colleagues for further questions. Um, when I, also, when I look at this data, and, and, and particularly I thank you all for showing the state data as well as uh, some of our counterparts across the, uh, across the state. Um, what, I, what I would hope is, I would hope that all of us get a real sense of Fort Worth pride. Uh, when it comes to what we're doing, a competitive spirit. Can I tell you right now, it burns me up. When I look at other, when I look at Dallas or Austin or San Antonio, I call them out by name, and they're doing better than us anyway. I get upset because they're not better than us. We're better than them. And they can look at this video later and get mad, but they'll be all right, right? <laughs> I'm from Fort Worth, and this is what, and when we are capable, right? Yep. And it's healthy competition and beautiful competition it should be, but it should be that um, much like our superintendent alludes to all the time, about, uh, about uh, rising all boats, rising the tide, right? So, so if we're doing better and that healthy competition is brewing, then all of us are doing better across the state because the state numbers are abysmal. But Fort Worth should be the flagship that's leading the way and saying that that's not acceptable. And I think that we really do have all of that. We have that in us. We just have to showcase that. We do have to showcase that. That's the adults that care type thing, right? That, uh, that our counterparts are just not going to be better than us. We're going to beat them. Our students are going to, people are going to be here because they know that we have top-notch education, facilities, everything, right? So I just think that's something that we all have to instill in one another, keep prideful tendencies in all of us, that we beat, that we beat the heck out of everybody that's around us and so let them know what time it is, right? So, um, but I really do appreciate y'all. Thank you very much for the support. Next, we have Trustee Norman Robbins. Thank you, President Ramos. Uh, this is very enlightening information, and while it's horrifying in many respects, the, the detail that you provide as you were speaking of 
Mrs. Zarisby, is, is very important to us. And we have asked for that for many years. And the fact that you all are now providing that amount of detail to us on a regular basis is very much appreciated. So thank, thank you so much. Ms. Breed, I think I heard you say that 71 campuses had had some form of restorative practice. That is correct. Of, of that number, how many roughly are high schools, middle schools, or elementary schools? I don't have it here exactly with me, but I would say we started with, before it was with us, it started with elementary, so I would say the larger number okay. has been with elementary. I know that there have been many high schools and middle schools that have requested the training, and the team has been there. Our goal is to have more uh, open, this is something new this year, for schools that wanted the training. We, the, I said we, I wasn't training, the restorative practice specialists and team were training principals, teachers, counselors, and others about the um, restorative practice strategies. Wonderful. I would hope that we could advance this to the secondary level as fast as possible. I think that would help us address the, the problems that we experience today and that we experience in many days. So thank, thank mm -hmm. you for that. Thank you. And on the social-emotional training, ooh, we need to have a sense of urgency about that. So I appreciate Dr. Washington and opinion and, that, that we are working on that, I think we would all be interested in seeing whatever your plan is when it is developed. And I would hope that we could do something as soon as possible because that is really, really important and, and really does lead to many of our students acting the way they do. So the sooner we can address that, the better. So yes, sir. Thank, thank you all. <clears throat> Trustee Anael Luevanos. Thank you, President Ramos. Well, Ms. Norm, you have asked my questions. <laughs> But how long um, before the other schools get uh, training? Well, actually, we uh, do have some uh, plannings for some restorative practice opportunities for this upcoming summer and uh, for some other schools to come in. Um, if, you, if I may, I don't want to give you any incorrect information, Dr. Benavides. If I'm saying any, no, there you are. If there's, I'm saying anything that's incorrect, Phil, just stand up and just come to the podium. <laughs> so I just want to be sure. So she's going, mm-hmm, but no, come to the podium. Um, but I know that we've talked about that and why she's coming. Dr. Benavides did share with me today that um, working with, doc, with Mrs. Bethany, Cindy Bethany, was, was social and emotional, that the restorative practice specialist, restore, um, her specialist and trauma specialist and okay. case managers. Yes. So you might want to expand on that so a little bit. So part of the collaboration that we're doing now is working together to look at the systems that we have already put in place at our schools so that we can work collaboratively because what we're doing currently is providing about two to three different people to support teachers who are struggling in our schools. And what we want to do is be more systematic about what that looks like. Um, so in collaboration with our trauma specialists, we're also going to be working um, to meet the needs of our schools in a more structured way. Um, so that's what Ms. Breed is referring to. And part of our plan for um, more professional development this summer is to ensure um, that we also train all of our administrators. Um, if you'd like, we can train our board members on what restorative practices is um, and, and how we implement it at our school level. Um, and then also train all of our um, uh, uh, executive directors because what we're, our, we're finding that our gap is that we don't have all those people currently trained um, and understand what that looks like in our schools so that when we are looking for that implementation, um, our schools are being successful in, in following through with those proactive preventative um, strategies. So do we think by the end of the summer all of the rest of the schools will have uh, been provided the training that we need? I wouldn't, I wouldn't say all of our schools, but I would say we're going to try to target more of our schools, and strategically we're going to select the schools, like as you asked, the middle school and high schools that currently do not have the training so that we can provide those to them because we know that that's a very high area of need. And in reflection of looking at the data since I've come in, we, we know that that is a gap that we have as well. Thank you. Okay. Trustee Endar. Um, I can only speak for myself as a board member, but I would like to receive the restorative discipline training. I feel like that would better help me, help the schools that I serve, and the students in Fort Worth ISD. So, yes, I would like to receive that training. And I know the Racial Equity Committee subcommittee with discipline had asked for sitting in on some of the training as well. Okay. Looks like those are all the questions and comments from the board. We thank you very, very much. We will now recess and reconvene in regular session in the board conference room.
time for public comment and I know this is just our first reading of this policy but um, where we if we can't am I reading this correctly that we can't this policy we're not limiting the number of people so are we opening ourselves up for 20 people to get up and say the same thing and then is this a legal requirement or is this just something where so it is with okay. HB 2840 that is one of the changes okay. uh, but you recall that we're waiting to hear back on the Attorney General opinion in the Blanco County okay. uh, which talks about uh, limiting time and with regard to number of, of uh, items spoken or uh, different things that the board can do okay yeah, and then if let's say, you know, we can't limit the number of people now we have the delegation of five or more You know, they have to we cannot delegate um, anymore. Either. That's state. That's law. A, and that's another change. Okay um, But then if we're limiting them to it says here no individual shall be given less than one minute You know, let's say we limited them to one minute. You can't say anything in one minute you know, I don't so that's like, that's the so. board's choice and okay. what what's happening here is that we're recommending that the actual procedure be taken out of the board policy okay. and that there be more discussion about the procedure okay. um, so we can do that before we hear from uh, with regard to the Blanco County I think the Blanco County decision will give us much more guidance okay. uh, but uh, this is just saying let's get the procedure out aligned with HB 2840 which says you can't limit the number of people that speak at public comment you cannot limit the amount of time less than one minute there is some language about limiting the so if you get to the point where you're you know you do see that the number of public uh, the people that have uh, signed up for public comment is somewhat uh, longer than usual uh, you could say we will only take public comment on I agenda items so there is some language to that point but those would be things that we would um, iron out in the procedures okay. and then make sure that the public is aware okay so we've made some changes already to the web language we've made some changes to the speaker cards and we've made some changes to uh, the president's script and so we'll just keep uh, making sure we're in an alignment Okay. Thank you. Any other questions from the board about any of the consent agenda items? Looks like we have no more, so we will now recess. I'm sorry. Yeah, we will now recess for executive session in the board conference room as authorized by Chapter 551.071551.072551.074 and .076.
I belong here. There's a place all parents want for their young child. Where learning happens in leaps and bounds in literacy, math, and social skills. Where teachers are state certified and super suited to provide structure, encouragement, and a nurturing safe space for every child. And that place is Fort Worth ISD, pre-K and kindergarten. Register online starting April 1st. Your child belongs here. be reading with the children today in small groups and interacting with them and enjoying the book together. El Chupacabras. Did I see it? He wore a bow tie and drank chocolate. Today is called a Whataburger Book Wish and it's through Whataburger and First Book. I think it's great anytime to get to read with kids and have fun and celebrate reading. So it's like a book party is what I told the children. This looks so big. Yeah. We have a couple of our employees volunteer that come out to talk to the kids and, the and share their stories the in the book. We like that story. Volunteering, it's, it's good for the soul. The community is important. It takes a village to raise a child. Whataburger is giving all of you a free book to take home with you today. The first book believes that education and reading is the way out of poverty for a lot of our kids in need. With partnership with Whataburger and CBS Media, we were able to distribute 70 $1,000 book wish grant. I'm excited to have my own copy. Reading is one of the most important things that you're going to learn how to do in school because if you can read, you can do anything. In accordance with the open meetings law, the board opened a meeting at 5.30 p.m. in a boardroom with a quorum present, recessed and reconvened, open session in a board conference room, uh, adjourned regular session, convened executive session, adjourned executive session, and now reconvened open session at 7.42 p.m. in the boardroom with a quorum present. Uh, we will now move on to number 12, accepting consent agenda item. Do I have a motion accepting consent agenda items? 
We have a motion by Trustee Jackson and a second by Trustee Robbins. Do we have any discussion? <laughs> Looks like no discussion. Please move the vote. Motion passes 8 4 and 0 against. We do not have 13 A. We do not have 13 B. We also do not have items for 14 A, 14 B, or 14 C. So we will move on to 14 D, which is approved campus turnaround plans for Morningside Middle School, J. Martin Jack Hay Middle School, and Leonard Middle School for school years 2020 to 2021 and 2021 to 2022. Looks like we have a motion by Trustee Jackson. We have a second by Trustee Robbins. Do we have any discussion on turnaround plans? <coughs> Looks like no discussion. Please move the vote. Motion passes 8-4 and 0 against. Moving on to 14-E, approved pyramid realignment and subsequent boundary and attendance zone changes. Do we have a motion? A motion by Trustee Paz and a second by Trustee Robbins. Discussion? Trustee Phillips. Thank you, President Ramos. Um, I'm just, um, this happens to be a, a pretty big deal, and I know that it's something that we haven't addressed um, in our district for quite some time. So with that being on the floor now, I guess I just really wanted to um, ask uh, Superintendent Scribner um, if you could address maybe some of the concerns that we have been hearing, and even particularly tonight we heard some concerns around this. Um, could you please address some of those concerns? Sure, absolutely. Thank you very much, uh, uh, President Ramos, Trustee Phillips, and, and members and members of the board. So uh, we have 143 uh, school communities, and it is true that we heard um, uh, significant uh, uh, input from, from one of those uh, tonight. Um, to kind of clarify, uh, this is a historic vote for Fort Worth ISD. Uh, uh, our board has not um, uh, taken a vote on adjustment of uh, school boundaries in more than 20 years. And a lot has changed in the last 20 years in Fort Worth with regard to our uh, population, demographic shifts, et cetera. Uh, the goals uh, of this board is to provide excellence and equity for all students. Uh, six months ago, our leadership team began uh, meeting across the city. Uh, we had 26 community forums uh, in every corner of the city uh, and across our district and, and other municipalities as well that are part of Fort Worth ISD. Uh, the goal tonight is to uh, establish for the first time in, in 20 years a coherent feeder pattern where students would start uh, in one pyramid in uh, pre-K and kindergarten all the way through through the 12th grade. Uh, uh, Trustee uh, Phillips wanted me to address some of the, some of the assertions uh, with the elementary school that we heard from today, South Hills Elementary. The st students who are going to South Hills Elementary will continue to go south to South Hills Elementary. Those students uh, currently go to South Hills High School, they'll continue to go to South Hills High School. There uh, is an assertion or a concern that they would be going across the, uh, the freeway to Wedgwood uh, Middle School. That was one of the options presented a few weeks ago. That is not the recommendation tonight. The recommendation tonight is that they stay within the South Hills Pyramid, South Hills Elementary, Rosemont Middle School, South Hills High School to achieve a vertical alignment. A vertical alignment we know uh, is important with regard to academic program, with regard to uh, uh, extracurricular activities, fine arts, band, music, uh, uh, the arts, um, uh, also athletics. Uh, we also know that um, that the board. Um, we heard you loud and clear on, in our um, at our retreat on February the eighth when you uh, talked about the need for vertical alignment in literacy, pre K through twelve. A vertical alignment uh, in mathematics pre-k through 12 so it would follow that the next logical step is to align our schools so that we can implement those in those programs and i recognize this is a difficult uh, decision i recognize there's a great deal of passion i would also like to point out that the major changes that are being recommended tonight will not take place until 2023 so we have uh, time of sufficient runway to ramp up and uh, and nothing worthwhile is uh, is ever easy. Thank you. Next, we have Trustee Luebanos. Thank you, President Ramos. Um, I would like to make a motion to um, to leave um, that we leave South Hills Elementary students where they are currently attending at McLean Middle. 
Okay, so I'm hearing you say you want to make an amendment to the motion. To, to leave uh, South Hills Elementary students at McLean. Okay, so we have an amendment on the floor. Um, we will need a second for, your, for the proposed amendment. We have a second? We have no second then, sorry? I'm sorry, I, I just have a point of order. Sure. And a respectful one. Um, so I never actually read the motion language from the original motion. Okay, please do. Okay. Let's do that for the record. Um, I move to approve the pyramid realignment and subsequent boundary and attendance zone changes as presented and to authorize the superintendent to adjust these as needed based on enrollment trends, academic programs, or facility needs. Okay. So that is the motion by Trustee Paz. Trustee Robbins, is that still your second? Yes. Uh -huh. So that's still your second. So having heard the motion as presented, Trustee Levanos, you want to proceed with? Can I make another amendment to the motion? So you'll withdraw your first amendment and then you'll do? Since I didn't get a second one, yeah. Okay. So we're on to a second proposed <clears throat> amendment by Trustee Levanos to the original amendment. What is that? I move that I should be delay on temporarily and the superintendent review and recommend final boundary attendance zones changes at Alice Contreras, Georgie Clark, South Hills Elementary and World Heights prior to the 2021-2022 academic year in preparation of the next bond election. This is in the anticipation that we can strive to ensure that all four ISD middle schools have equity in academic programs, course offerings, and extracurricular activities with the same safety and security policies where appropriate. At all middle schools and or before 2024, in that Forward ISD strive to offer the same classes that we offer at PASCO at each high school campus in order to demonstrate and activate, activate equity for all students. So just, just for clarification, you gave a, an amendment to the motion and then you gave a description. So would you just read your proposed amend, amended motion, and then we'll see if we get a second for further discussion. That's my um, motion to... Your amendment to the motion? Yes, to, to, Every, add, to add this to the original motion. Okay. So, Ben, can you help us out here? Because I, I, heard, I, heard I heard an amendment to the motion, and I heard a lengthy description as to the reason why there's the amendment to the motion. So that's my motion. Yes, so the, uh, the amended motion is to postpone, and correct me if I'm wrong, to postpone the decision till 2021, 2022 school year. For, for this? For school. Alice Contreras, Georgia C. Clark, South Hills, and Worth Heights uh, prior to the 2021-2022 academic school year. That's the amended motion. Okay, that's the amended motion. Do we have a second to the amended motion? And because we have this one on the screens, I'll ask that you raise your hand if you want to second the amended motion. Looks like we do not have a second, so it looks like that motion will, it, 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 dies. So it, it dies here. The so the main, we're going back to the main motion as, as proposed by Trustee Paz. Do we have any discussion on that? <coughs> Trustee Paz? Yes, thank you, um, President Ramos. And um, I thank you, Dr. Scribner, for your, um, for your remarks and your, the clarifications that you provided. Um, I just wanted to um, address the con some of the concerns that were heard here tonight as well, um, especially because we have young people in the audience. Um, it pains me to hear um, that, you, that you and your parents and your community feel, or to hear you say that you feel that you have not been heard and that um, comments, you know, um, such as modern day segregation and um, that you don't feel like your children are being given equal treatment. And, um, you know, as, as a parent, it, it breaks my heart to hear those things. As a school board member, it breaks my heart to hear those things, especially for the young people in the room. Um, you know, with that, with that said, um, I really hope that um, you understand that that is not the case. This has been an incredibly difficult decision for 
our district to make for, I mean, it, there are, when you're dealing with boundaries, it is never easy, and there are always people who are going to feel as if they're losing something um, on all, on kind of all, all over um, town, and we have, but there is one, you know, this just happens to be one community who um, I'm really proud to see that you have been empowered to come and speak up, and although, you know, I am going to support the um, recommendation of our superintendent. Um, I know that he has put a lot of, that he and our entire administrative staff have done nothing but consider what is the most equitable solutions to provide. And this, the academic, it, this isn't, we're not just changing boundaries and that's the only solution that we have. The district is investing millions of dollars into providing better opportunities in the schools that have not had it and to provide better training and to prioritize um, better teachers, more um, qualified teachers who have been in the classroom uh, for longer for the schools that have needed it the most and that this is not just a, a one-off one solution. This is a layer of the onion, so to speak, that um, is our superintendent and his staff's plan for giving all of our children, especially our black and brown children, better opportunities that ha they have not had in the past. And so even though um, this might not be the outcome that a lot of people want to see, I want you to, I want you to understand that you have been heard, and I hope that this is, you do not feel like um, you don't have a voice because this is, and your, your feedback did, did produce results. There were changes made to the original plan. Um, but also, we know that um, historically, brown students have been crammed into, the, into schools that are overcrowded, and that they have, they have been given less opportunities, and this, these changes are, they're changing that. And, you know, I just, I hope that this can be kind of a starting point for us. And we are empowering the superintendent to come back and to make changes if he sees that there, that there are things that need to be changed. Um, so that's, I just, I want to especially have the young people here that you have a board here who wants nothing but the best for you. And that is what we are driven um, driven by seeing better outcomes for you all. So, that's it. Thank you. Trustee Robbins. Thank you, President Ramos. I'd like to echo what Mrs. Paz just said, that uh, as, as part of the supplementary information on school boundary changes that the school district has put out, which many of you may not have seen, there is a statement in there that says we will continue to look at ways to make this better as we go forward. So I think you can expect in the next year or two or three as we progress on this path that I think we're going to pursue that we will look for ways to make it better for all of you. Uh, our goal is to make every school in Fort Worth excellent, not just a handful of schools, but every school in every neighborhood. So that is an unrelenting goal that we have. We'll continue to work on that until we have success. And we want to assure you all that we want you to be as successful as you can possibly be, and we'll work uh, to make that happen. So thank you. Thank you. Trustee Jackson. Thank you, President Ramos. I first want to commend my colleague and our colleague, Trustee Alneel Luebanos. You have worked diligently, tirelessly, and you've ex exerted yourself far beyond anything I've ever seen by anybody on this board to listen to this community. And I'm sorry that, that this has worked out this way. Uh, I was very touched by the comments tonight, touched by educators that spoke from South Hills Elementary, touched by parents that spoke, parents that said, I didn't have what I want my kids to have. And that makes this decision very, very tough for us. And I'm going to ask the, the superintendent to talk about a few things. And I didn't ask you this earlier, and I'm sorry, but the comments from the South Hills community prompted these, these thoughts. We're trying to become more efficient, and part of these attendance zones that haven't been changed in two decades are, it's my understanding, to decrease 
bus travel time for kids and time on buses and also diminish the number of highways that we are currently crossing. Is, is that correct? Um, absolutely. Um, uh, President uh, Ramos, um, uh, Trustee Jackson, members of the board, um, that is exactly what we're trying to do. We have uh, 209 square miles across Fort Worth ISD. What we're trying to do is create 13 smaller school communities to uh, be more efficient in terms of our transportation, but also to be more effective in terms of the opportunities that we, that we offer. Um, Trustee Robbins pointed out that it's important to have uh, great, high-quality opportunities in every corner uh, of the city. And uh, we believe that by creating vertical alignment so that there can be a continuity um, is, is a good thing. The, if, if the board uh, uh, approves this recommendation tonight, we will change the fact that we have one middle school that sends students to three different high schools, that we have one school that serves students in this community, but that school is not located in that community. It's located in another community. These are the kinds of things that happen when we have not um, addressed our boundaries in over 20 years, and we're trying to fix that so we can have excellence, we can have equity, uh, we can have efficiency, and we can offer more choice across our district. You almost made it on alliteration. You had to run it with that last word. Uh, I, I do have another question, President Ramos, if I could. Yes, absolutely. Uh, <coughs> being as the South Hills attendance zone goes into play in 2023, if you were to see during this runway, as we've called it, that there were some other efficiencies, there's an opportunity that this could be changed. Is that, is that correct, that, that we could add other efficiencies? There may be some changes. This isn't the end of your work. Absolutely. I, I, I see the, um, as I read uh, the supporting material and um, the motion made by Trustee Paz, that the proposed changes can be adjusted as needed based on enrollment trends, academic programs, and facility needs. And I also heard um, um, uh, Trustee Luevanos um, implore us to work very hard with our, with our academics team and our, and our school leadership team to offer the same kinds of opportunities at each of our schools, each of our high schools and each of our middle schools. There is a domino effect. By, by making this, this change, by not making this change here, we would certainly affect other communities, and we don't want to make uh, changes in one community that negatively impacts, impacts another. Um, the, uh, the domino effect also of board, board policy decisions. Our decision to have a common schedule at the high school and a common schedule at the middle school will also allow for more efficiencies in order to offer um, high-end uh, academic programs, but also supporting programs for students who are struggling. Thank you very much. And Trustee Luebanos, I will work with you, and I'm sure this board will work with you to make sure that we can build the best outcomes that we can. Uh, thank you all. Next, we have Trustee Dar. Thank you, President Ramos. I, too, um, would like to commend Mr. Luebanos on the way he has listened to his community. I would also like to commend that community for finding their voice and using their voice and uh, making sure that, that we hear that you are passionate about education because you do um, deserve the best education possible for your children. Um, the part of the description that uh, Mr. Lebanos gave regarding the fact that we should have equal programming, this is a part of equity, is equal programming on every middle school campus. And that is where we really need to be focusing. I heard Dr. Scribner say it. I've heard Trustee Lebano say it. I've heard Trustee Jackson say it as well. Um, that tonight is one vote. And it's not the end of the road. It is the beginning of a journey to make this happen for every student in Fort Worth ISD. As an educator, I, am, I firmly believe in vertical alignment. I firmly believe in the power of knowing when kids start in pre-K where they're going so they can best work up that path in, toward graduation with consistency and with, um, with integrity and with fidelity. And to um, create a path for one school that veers from that vertical alignment really would be more of an inequity to those students 
because they would not be able to benefit from that vertical alignment, and that would be remiss on our part to allow that to happen. Um, but again, to repeat, I think it's extremely important that we're looking at all middle schools and making sure that programs that are offered on one campus are offered on a second campus and a third and a fourth, because there's great things going on on every middle school campus, and we need to make sure that we're capitalizing on that with all of our students. Thank you. Next, we have Trustee Luevanos. I would like to um, echo what uh, Trustee Dar mentioned, that I would like to see uh, this um, board and this district to focus on our middle school all the way across. I mean, we've seen the numbers, 12% on seventh grade are on the mad level. Uh, so if we don't build the foundation on the middle school, then how can we ask our students to succeed in high school when we are not uh, providing the foundation on middle school? And this is the work that um, I believe our trustees and, and staff can do to improve um, all middle schools across the district. We have uh, high academic um, programs in one, in one middle school, but we don't have that uh, in the rest of the district. And this has been going on for years. Um, I am glad we are doing this now. We, I don't want to wait another 20 years for the same programs to be effective at other um, middle schools, because at the end of the day, our students are the ones suffering because we don't offer the same uh, programs uh, across the district. Thank you. Thank you. Next, we have Trustee Evans. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, um, this has not been an easy process, and it hasn't boiled down to necessarily an easy decision. Um, I, I know all of us here up on this dais and all of y'all, we're striving to make sure that Fort Worth ISD offers um, high quality middle school programming across the board um, at every single uh, middle school we have for um, so we can have equity in our academic programming, course offerings, extracurricular activities like Trustee Luevanos was just talking about. Same goes for our safety and security policies at all our middle schools and our comprehensive high schools so we can demonstrate the equity and excellence across the board in every neighborhood. Thank you. Trustee Phillips. Thank you, President Ramos. So, um, so I, don't, I don't want this to in any, way, in any way appear to be a dog and pony show. Right? So I want us to be transparent, and I feel like my colleagues are doing so, and thank you for doing so. And I feel like the administration has, has been doing so with us as well. But to truly address the elephant in the room, and for us to be about what we say that we're moving forward and being about, which is race equity, um, not being afraid to isolate race, right? Brown folks showed up tonight. They showed up in our inboxes. They showed up in these community forums. Latinx folks were showing up telling us that they felt like this system was about to do them over again. Growing up in Fort Worth as a person of color myself, I know all too well what that feeling feels like when you feel like something is happening to you and you really can't do anything about it, right? So I've received and my colleagues have received information that leads us to this point now to where we feel like good decisions are being made and whatever the vote, and everyone gets to vote individually about what their conscience is with that. What I would like to have addressed right now in real terms so this is not something that is just mulled over. I need brown folks on that side of town. I need the South Hills community to not feel like they are being, being screwed over. I need, uh, I need them to not feel like we are forcing out Latinx, uh, the Latinx community from schools in which they feel are servicing them well uh, for the sake of doing so. And, all right. So I would, like, I would like for that to be addressed, please. Sure. And, and this, this, um, this uh, recommendation um, moves students from, who are currently at Rosemont Middle School uh, who go to George C. Clark, uh, Alas Contreras, uh, Worth Heights into... Um, um, the, uh, that already are in the Pascal Pyramid uh, into an aligned pyramid so that they will remain in the Pascal Pyramid, not only in elementary, go to, go to a different period of middle school, back to Pascal for high school, but that they will remain in the Pascal Pyramid pre-K through 12 in the same way that South Hills will remain in the South Hills uh, Pyramid pre-K through 12. And, 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 the, dem and the demographic um, uh, shift is, um, is virtually the same. 
and, the, and, and we've had the assurances, one, that the parents who have children in these schools right now, their children will continue to be educated in the schools in which they have chosen for their, choose, their uh, child to be educated in. Sure. Um, yes. In fact, um, the implementation of, the, of this change won't take place till 2023, and we'll be grandfathering students who are already in the school and, uh, and address those issues. And again, we have the opportunity to adjust this uh, on an as-needed basis uh, based on enrollment trends, academic program, or facility needs. And if we're seeing, if we're hearing from our community that, that, that they are, in fact, not being served well by this change, and research and data are showing us that we are not hitting the mark when it comes particularly to isolating rights, that there are Latinx people over here who are not getting ser served in the way that we saw fit when this whole thing came about, we can then come back and amend this. Absolutely. And, in fact, uh, it's, my, it's my belief that, um, that by making this change, that community will be, in fact, better served. We have some great opportunities with alignment, with efficiencies to embed um, high uh, um, academically rigorous programs uh, in uh, the middle school and the the elementary that is next to it that would that would be able to ha house sixth graders uh, that don't that doesn't currently exist uh, at Rosemont. So so we'll be, we we can come back with a with a report on uh, on our middle schools. I know that that will be a, a focus uh, not only uh, in in the short term but certainly in the long term as we look forward to. Um, to uh, increased investment in our in our teacher safety, security, academic programs, but also um, as um, uh, Trustee Luevanos pointed out, um, in a in a future bond. Thank you, Dr. Scribble. Thank you for the floor, President Ramos. Trustee Jackson. Thank you, President Ramos. Uh, Dr. Scribner, if you could, you had how many town halls? Uh, we had 26. Thank you for doing that, and I know that was a lot of work. I want to ask if we can update the community as we move through this with a town hall, if, if that would be possible, if we could think about that. And also looking at a timeline where we'll have some ideas, and I know that's putting you on the spot, sure. but some kind well, of a timeline. Absolutely. And I would commend this board because previous boards, when they made smaller changes in, um, in boundaries, made the decision in this room, and then we went out and did the town halls. This process, we did 26 town halls to bring back information and make changes. Uh, the good example here was, was Wedgwood versus, versus the Rosemont final decision in, in, in the most recent case. Um, but, uh, but clearly, the backup information does have a timeline of implementation. Um, our staff will be going out to all of those communities that, are, um, that, that will be seeing change, some of them, uh, which are very... Um, 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 you know, positively accepted changes. We're going to be making those moves, in fact, this, this August. But most of them will be 2021, 2022, and then the larger ones in 2023. And that will not happen in a vacuum. Will the same 26 um, uh, town hall style of transparency that we did to get to this point will do moving forward as well. Great. Thank you so much. Thank you. Trustee Levanos. Thank you, President um, Ramos. So... Dr. Skinner, you mentioned the word um, better serve and that community. So how soon can we see a plan on how are we going to better serve all of our middle schools across the district? Absolutely. So I think in the, in, in the short term, we, we can provide a, um, a current status. Um, uh, we'll be coming back to you, uh, board, uh, later this spring with plans for the fall that I think um, um, we're going to need your support on to make some of those decisions. The creation of aligned feeder patterns, of aligned pyramids, provides another opportunity for principal supervision. Uh, right now we have um, some executive directors supervising high school principals, some supervising elementary principals. We are now going to have the opportunity to do two things, to have the executive director in charge of the entire pyramid, so there will be a sense of accountability. If the if parent is struggling, I know who the executive director who supervises all of those principals is. The, the, the high school principal, the one or two middle schools, and the five or six elementaries. That's one. Two, uh, we are having conversations about embedding our sixth grade centers, which have struggled, into the middle schools. Now, in some cases, the, 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 they will remain on the same piece of property, but it will be my uh, uh, recommendation that we assign an individual to supervise, an executive principal, if you will, to, 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 uh, to ensure that, uh, that there is a good instruction at the middle school, that they're safe and orderly campuses, and the same opportunities exist in, in, all, in all 13 pyramids. Okay, right, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Scribner. Um, just want to make some brief points. One, 
um, want to echo everything my colleagues have said on this board. Um, my initial years in Fort Worth Independent School District, I started off at W.J. Turner. The next year, they, we got a note that we had to go to Sam Rosen. And then the next year, when it got a note that we had to go to Kirkpatrick Elementary, and then got a note again that I had to go back to W.J. Turner. Um, I did not understand when I was a child how those decisions were made. And another elephant in the room is that this board and this superintendent, this administration, had to take on a super tough topic that was 20 years overdue. And that's about gerrymandering and how we end up hurting families and young people because adults want to change things for political reasons. And that's not healthy for anybody. And so what this board decided to do is to take on the task to make the tough decisions and to remove the politics out of this boardroom and to be able to make decisions based on data and information as we best have it now. And I commend the superintendent for leaving it open-ended to not say this is the end-all, be-all. So that if something changes or something arises and the data points shift, that that happened. Another unexpected thing that I think was happening during those years and has continued to happen is that we have these perceptions that certain parts of neighborhoods are better than others, that certain schools are better than others. And while by statistically that might be the case in certain scenarios, I do believe that this superintendent administration and board are determined to get rid of that. That when we talk about alignment is that we're not going to have this perception that one school or one neighborhood is better than mine. That deficit mentality is what continues to riddle this school district. And then that leads us really to the reason why we talk about equity so much. It's probably been said a hundred times a night. We just realized tonight collectively that equity isn't easy. And it takes courageous human beings to be able to do the work. And I really do strongly believe that that's what's happening. So that if I could talk to that kid that I was, like why I was going to Sam Rosen and Kirkpatrick and Kirkpatrick Elementary and then back to W.J. Turner, I couldn't understand that then. And today we could. So I understand that from me, an I statement, I didn't take this lightly at all either. We, did, we dug in. We did the homework. We did the research. We listened to the superintendent. And at the end of the day, he and his team are the educational experts, not me. I'm a community member that's advocating for families and community para la gente, no doubt. But I also have to recognize that my limitations are just that. So the final piece I'll give you is that what you're witnessing is a turn of, of something better of why we're doing governance. That it's not about one board member or a couple of board members. It's about a governing body making decisions for the entire community. And that means that we're going to have way more uncomfortable conversations. The old days of being able to lobby a board member or two and getting politics done in these boardrooms is exactly what creates division in boardrooms. And the reason why school boards seem to really be struggling, not only statewide but nationwide, what I want to tell you is that we're witnessing some history here today that we're having true dialogue in the front and not behind closed doors, that we're willing to have the tough conversations for improved student achievement, and we're willing to hold ourselves accountable and the administration and the leadership accountable. And for that, se lo agradecemos. We thank you, the families, the community, for coming out. Los estudiantes, más que nada, young people, it's so powerful that you're here at 8.15 at nighttime because you let your voice be heard. And I think you heard it from us. It didn't go without being heard. Thank you for that. So it looks like we have no more comments or questions from the board. We will now proceed to vote. Motion passes 7-4 and 1 against. Moving on to 14-F, approved board resolution and contract of sale to purchase 27-plus acre parcel in the John Bercy survey, abstract number 128, and the heirs of Hayes Covington survey, survey, abstract number 256, Fort Worth, Tarrant County, Texas. Looks like we have a motion by Mr. Robbins and we have a second by um, Trustee Evans. Do we have any discussion on this item? Looks like we have no discussion. Please move to vote. Motion passes 8-4 and 0 against. Our grievance on uh, 14-G has been postponed. So at this point, we'll move on to 15 comments by board members or superintendent or current district activities and announcements. Do we have any announcements from the board or the superintendent? Trustee Dar. I just quickly want to thank Mr. Naughton for all of his work on the process of redistricting. I'm pretty sure that he dreams in maps <laughs> and colors 
and little flags that are red and green and blue. And um, I know that this was not an easy process. I appreciate the fact that um, not only are we looking at equity issues, at, at, at academic issues, but we are also trying to make these changes without a complete fruit basket turnover where the least number of people are being moved to a new location in order to make one bigger, better district, and I know that he put in a lot of work for that, and as well as the staff, and um, this was a true team effort, but um, I'm pretty sure he does dream in maps. So, <laughs> thank you. Trustee Phillips. Thank you, President Ramos. Um, um, this, this past weekend on Saturday, um, was able to, uh, I was able to have the privilege of being um, in San Antonio and watching uh, our board president here uh, take the gavel as the president of the Mexican American School Board Association. And, um, and he'll turn red here in a little bit, but I just need to tell him publicly that I'm proud of him, even though I've told him very many times uh, privately um, that it really is impressive the work that he's doing and not only leading us in Fort Worth ISD, but across the state and across the nation. Um, and um, he deserves a round of applause for that. So if y'all can join me in that, please. And the sacrifice I made was not being able to see the beautiful work that was going on in the capital of Fort Worth, Stop 6, Texas, because uh, we did have some beautiful work going on there. And so I believe we may have some photos or something um, of the work that was being done this weekend. Texas A&M uh, Law School was able to partner with uh, some community partners and uh, faculty members, um, parents, t uh, students, to come and do some beautification projects there at uh, Sunrise McMillan, right there in the capital of Fort Worth, Stop 6. So I'm just so glad that they were able to do that, to beautify our schools. This is, this is what we need. We, uh, these are all of our schools. Um, it's not us as board members. It's not just administration or campus principals. Like, these are all of our schools. So when the community comes together uh, to really uh, take ownership and pride in that, uh, we all win, and particularly our students win. So I'm just so grateful that people set aside time to be able to do that, and you just helped um, make, make Fort Worth a better place, and particularly Stop 6. I'm very proud of it. Thank you for everyone who participated in that. Thank okay. Thank you, Trustee Phillips. Looks like there's no more comments from the Board of Superintendent, so this meeting is now adjourned. <laughs>